All right, uh, today I'm going to speak on a subject that maybe is a little bit of a departure from the norm. Um, a little departure maybe from the, the style of, uh, of sermon. Uh, 25 years ago or so, Tina and I sat in our living room uh, late in the evening with our pastor at the time, and we had him come over because uh, our daughter was ill and, and we felt it was fairly urgent. And so it was one of those late night phone calls that as a parent, you kind of hate to wake up the pastor late at night, but uh, it was urgent enough we did. Um, and we certainly felt bad that we were asking him to come over that late. Um, after the anointing, he, he seemed uh, quite content to sit in our living room and, uh, and just chat with us for a while. Um, probably, uh, now that I have that perspective, probably a time to kind of detox about the situation that happened and, and provide some peace and uh, an outlet. Um, it's been so long ago that I really don't remember how we got on the subject of child rearing during that conversation. Uh, whether it was planned or not, I don't know. Um, uh, either Tina and I, uh, uh, during that conversation, asked a, uh, the inevitable question. I think that a lot of us, when we were raising our kids, would ask if we got in conversations with those that uh, have uh, child rearing in the rear view mirror. Um, we asked uh, to pass along some parental wisdom to us. Um, and, he, and he took a breath, and then he said something similar to this. And I won't get it completely accurate because my memory isn't uh, picture perfect, but he said, childbearing is not a perfect science. Sometimes what works for one family uh, doesn't work for another. Sometimes what works for one child uh, doesn't work um, well for the next in the same family. Um, the reality is you're always a more equipped parent after you raise your children and they move on to commanding their own lives. Probably most of, if not all of you, have experienced that. <laughs> some way or another. Uh, this is a fact that Tina and I are full aware of now as empty nesters and grandparents. We are much more patient parents than we ever were when we were raising our four. And uh, so his words did ring true in our life. He continued, the best counsel I can give is begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. Well, if you're looking for a title, that's the title today. Begin with the end in mind. Uh, he went on to say he did not coin that phrase, uh, that he had uh, picked it up years ago uh, from a Stephen Covey book that probably uh, many of you have read, uh, entitled Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, I recognized the book. Um, because my father had read it, and he had passed it uh, on to me to read. Uh, but hearing him talk about it uh, connected um, past thoughts that I had in reading that book. And, and it connected to us and what we were going through at the time, raising four kids. Um, and the idea resonated with us and has stuck in our lives um, through all those years. As parents, it's uh, natural for us to think about our kids' futures. Um, all of us want our kids to, uh, to grow up and be successful, well-balanced adults. Um, in the body of Christ, we want more than that, right? Uh, we want our kids to have a, a personal, productive relationship with God. Uh, we understand our children are, are, are really God's children. And while we have them for about 18, 20 years at home with us, um, they're God's children for eternity. And so uh, as parents of children, we feel the impact, the heaviness of that responsibility. 
begin with the end in mind is a, is a pretty easy concept to understand. Uh, when I, I spoke on this originally a few years ago, uh, it was on the Sabbath that we typically set aside as a, as a church to uh, bless the little children uh, after the feast. Um, now we don't have too many parents raising kids in this congregation, I get it. Uh, but the principle remains just as important to Tina and I today as it did back then when we were in the throes of raising kids. The principle uh, sticks in your life. Um, as detailed by Stephen Covey in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, um, this habit is the second one listed in the book. Uh, this book was uh, released in 1989 and immediately became an, an incredible resource uh, for growth and development. Um, corporations gleaned uh, from its principles as well. It was, a, it was a rich individual value as well. Uh, people, individuals who read the book uh, gleaned a lot of value from it in applying the principles to their life. And, and uh, many people began to really incorporate and own these particular habits to better their lives. But perhaps the most impacting value of all uh, was, it, was its direct influence on families and a profound way in which it would guide families to function better as a family unit. Today, I, I want to explore this habit that Stephen Covey coined, begin with the end in mind. Um, and we're going to examine it because this principle is, it just fits quite nicely into how we raise and tend our families. Um, and while I know there, again, are very few here that probably are raising kids at the time, it also fits nicely into our calling and how we interact with each other here in the family of God. Um, so let me begin by, by reading from the book concerning uh, habit two, uh, begin with the end in mind. Let's see if I marked it correctly. So he says, uh, in your mind's eye, see yourself going to the funeral of a loved one. Picture yourself driving to the funeral parlor or chapel, parking the car, getting out. As you walk inside the building, you notice the flowers, the soft music. You see the faces of friends and family you pass along the way. You feel the shared sorrow of losing, the joy of having known, that radiates from the hearts of the people there. As you walk down to the front of the room and look inside the casket, you suddenly come face to face with yourself. This is your funeral. All these people have come to honor you, to express feelings of love and appreciation for your life. As you take a seat and wait for the services to begin, you look at the program in your hand, and there are to be four speakers. The first is from your family, immediate and also extended children. Brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, aunts, uncles, cousins, and grandparents who have come from all over the country to attend. The second speaker is one of your friends, someone who can give a sense of what you were as a person. The third speaker is from your work or profession. The fourth is from your church, where you've been involved in service. Now think deeply, what would you like each of these speakers to say about you and your life? What kind of husband, wife, father, or mother would you like their words to reflect? What kind of son or daughter or cousin? What kind of friend? What kind of working associate? What character would you like them to have seen in you? What contributions, what achievements would you want them to remember? Look carefully at the people around you 
What difference would you like to have made in their lives? So now you conceptually understand where the author is going when he says, begin with the end in mind. Make a statement that's very true, and is very true in, in our lives and raising our family. Children don't just become something. They are made something. Children don't just become something. They are made something. They are made what they are made. But everything from deliberate, visionary planning on one end of the spectrum to doing what comes natural on the other end of the spectrum all comes into play, doesn't it? Each one of us can look back into our own personal developmental timeline, and we can trace our habits and character makeup. We can uh, trace them back to the very early stages of our life, someone being deliberate about how they taught us, either through personal example, discipline, um, education, or all of these. What a blessing it is when an infant is born into a family where it has all the elements it needs to choose to be successful when it reaches maturity. I suspect that many of you listening today can probably point to some holes that existed in your upbringing that uh, manifested itself in your life in ways that have um, not been pleasant, been challenging to you through the years. Um, you may be able to go back and, and look at some of those, the origin of some of those characteristics or habits uh, as you begin to desire to change them. Maybe those habits or things that you were given uh, at a younger age cost you some relationships along the way cost you professions, uh, cost you money, cost you uh, loss in some way, uh, maybe deep personal harm. Uh, and here we're dealing with these things many, many years later under God's scriptural tutelage, um, repairing the damage done and, and changing our base from which we operate, from flawed, carnal, uh, you know, physical view to a godly spiritual foundation. Uh, there's an observation I will share that probably won't surprise any of you. One of the greatest failings uh, in dysfunctional families is child rearing by reaction. Uh, a deeply dysfunctional family operates without protection and blessing of planning when that happens. So if you sit back and you watch families like this, uh, you'll see the eventual chaos and, and pain that takes over in their lives. Um, to a certain extent, uh, dysfunction exists in every household in some form or fashion. Uh, it certainly did in ours. Um, if it didn't, we would uh, certainly be much more perfect than we are. The reality is we, we all have things that we were given by our parents that we must uh, work on and work to overcome and change. On top of the things we've added to our own lives that are challenges for us. Our greatest contribution to our children is know where you want to go and both rear and steer them to that end. God our Father in, in Exodus and in Deuteronomy teach in, in very simple terms the Ten Commandments. Uh, ten things to do and don't do to ensure uh, a positive relationship with Him. Uh, he offers a happier life and some uh, promises He makes uh, that if we 
do these things, he will fulfill these uh, promises. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 5. And we're just going to read a couple of, of uh, scriptures there. Embedded in the, the second commandment is uh, both wise counsel and a promise from the Father. And I'll, I'll read out of the New Living Translation to just make the language a little easier to digest. Uh, Deuteronomy 5, chap, uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 9 and 10. It says, You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. The reality is God does not have to sit on his throne and place any kind of specific curse on those individuals that don't follow him. Nor does he need to bless those who do. It happens naturally. God just lets it happen. Each generation will pass on to their children the cursings that come from not obeying God. And we eventually get to the place where the world um, was during Noah's time and is rapidly approaching uh, the same condition today. Remember, in Noah's time, people intended and practiced only evil continually. But Noah was also a representative of the blessing side of what the Father mentions in Deuteronomy. In Genesis 6, 8, Noah had found favor in the sight of the Lord. And in verse 9 of, of Genesis 6, it says, This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect or righteous, in his generations. Noah walked with God. So why did Noah find favor? Well, he walked with God. It's the easy answer to that question. Why did he walk with God? He came from a genealogy who walked with God. Uh, it's interesting to note that Noah's father Lamech was with him and died uh, shortly before the flood. Lamech would have uh, been alive for the last 56 years of Adam's life. You realize there's uh, quite an overlap there. Um, and certainly Noah would have uh, known Enoch, his grandfather, who the scriptures say, walked with God as well. Noah would have been alive for the first 60 years of Abraham's life. It's interesting. They lived so long that there was some overlap there. There was a genealogy of people Noah was connected to that had a history of walking with God. Now, I'm saying all of this because Noah just didn't uh, wake up one day righteous. Um, in much the same way, Abraham just didn't all of a sudden become faithful. It took time. We read the short little sections of Scripture, and in many cases, we're just not privy to the backstory of what was in motion long before these men reached a place where God proclaimed them righteous or faithful. Someone had to begin with the end in mind in their lives. Now, all of, all of us have backstories. <clears throat> what do I mean by, by backstory? Well, Tina and I were talking with uh, other couples in the church about uh, 15 or 20 years ago in a, in a social setting, and, and we were chatting about our children in a, in a general sense, um, the kind of small talk that's normal for people to, to do when they have uh, things in common. 
uh, like parenting. So uh, we were all gathered together there talking about our kids and our experiences. And we were on the topic of, of uh, challenges of parenting and how some kids are just tougher to raise than others. And uh, how difficult it had been for one set of parents uh, with their seemingly high energy children. And I remember this uh, parent then turning to Tina and I and making a statement that spoke to, that really spoke to their inability to fully understand a backstory of our family. They said, you're fortunate that you have such even-tempered children. How do you think that comment made us feel? We didn't respond, uh, but you can be sure that our conversation in the car on the way home was spirited uh, in that regard. Um, it was, to be sure, a very ignorant statement that one made with a very kind of myopic and selfish view. <laughs> Um, in this simple statement, all of the years of focused and deliberate hard work was cheapened, discredited. In this person's mind, we had been handed a stacked deck of four perfect children. This situation taught us a, a valuable lesson about seeing the face of a building but not knowing what's going on inside. The old judging a book by its cover lesson. But this situation also offered up another lesson. How had we been able to raise our children to a standard where others would look at them and say, oh, they must have been so easy to raise. You're so lucky. Following the begin with the end in mind topic, there's a part of this that, that, that comes natural to us um, if we just think about parenthood in, in that regard. Uh, God's kind of hardwired us as humans. Um, when a couple gets pregnant for the first time, there is a, there's a joy like no other. Um, it's unique. Uh, the minds of uh, both the perspective uh, father and, uh, and mother turn to nesting in their own way. Um, every thought concerning the house, the furniture, the cabinets, whether they have hooks on them, uh, the plants, uh, do we have a car seat, uh, the car, the type of car, the pets we have, uh, everything that a newborn all the way down through the toddler age would disrupt in your current life is under a microscope, right? There isn't anything within a parent's control that won't be examined and found either safe or not safe for their child. And, and if it's not safe, it's either either repaired or gotten rid of or new things bought. So what are they doing? What are these new prospective parents doing? They're beginning with the end in mind. They're looking down the road and they're saying, I've got to make these changes so my child is safe in this environment. They instinctively know they must get this child from complete dependence to some form of independence and then what that looks like in their home. And they've got to get it to the point where they're completely dependent to a place where they're confident they can reason with the child. And the child can understand and then follow instructions well enough to bring some amount of safety to itself and to others in the house. So how had, how had Tina and I been able to make what was not easy look easy to someone else from the outside? We had a, a level of inherent ability that we did not fully understand at the time. And I think all parents do. I think you enter 
that time in your life and you think, what in the world am I doing? I don't know how to do this. And there's some inherent ability that takes over this uh, care that drives what you do. Remember, I made the statement earlier, children don't just become something, they are made something. Something was happening inside of our family that we hadn't fully considered and understood. And it wasn't being blessed with children that were just easy to raise. That wasn't it. It was a backstory. It was uh, Deuteronomy 5 of God paying it forward through our parents' obedience to him. Built within us was a, a foundation of godly teaching and experience in living what God teaches. Uh, parents before us had received this blessing from God for oh, being obedient to him, and we were benefiting from that obedience, even if we hadn't recognized it before. This is the old chicken or the egg um, conversation. Uh, the egg could not exist without the chicken. Uh, but God had to create a fully functional chicken before an egg could be laid. And so this is what we were experiencing as young parents. If we can find ourselves beginning with the end in mind naturally as new parents plan for the, the safety of their coming child, then we can, we can kind of grasp this concept that Stephen Covey coined in this book. God hardwired into humanity a basic ability to begin with the end in mind. So we understand the principle and we see it in its most basic form. And we have a fundamental understanding that God not only understands this principle, but he is the progenitor of it. And he is the rewarder of it. Okay, so we can begin with the end in mind on a small scale or a small project like, like the first two years of a baby's life, if you want to call that small, an infant's life. But the same principle applies to longer projects and lengthier timelines. I... I I think we also are wise enough in, in this room to, uh, uh, we're filled here with, with well-seasoned veterans of life, that this principle, principle doesn't just apply to childbearing, uh, but it applies to every one of us in sculpting and shaping our lives and in helping our spiritual brothers and sisters shape and sculpt their lives. I'm going to present some more illustrations that will help us. Um, but before I do, uh, let me stop briefly and address a, a counterfeit, if you will. Uh, there's a clever counterfeit that exists that uh, many young parents grab onto uh, that can lead them in the wrong direction. And I think we can identify with this counterfeit as well, whether we're raising kids or not. Counterfeit uh, means made in exact imitation of something valuable or important with the intention to deceive or defraud. That's a counterfeit. Almost everyone arrives at a place in life where they're unhappy with something, uh, maybe some or, or all of the elements of their upbringing. Um, we can have very strong feelings concerning the faults we perceive in our parents and the way they reared us. I think it's somewhat a natural part of our maturity as a person to grow through this stage where we can look back at our parents and say, man, they were terrible at this. Or man, I wish they would have done this better. With a tad bit of ignorance to the amount of work it takes to do the job, they were doing, right? I think that's just a stage in life that we all seem to pass through. 
it manifests itself by something like, I'm not going to do that with my kids. I won't ask for a raise of hands, but I bet many of us parents in here said that statement at least once in their life. I know I have. Parents who suffer from this motivation can be deeply committed parents. But they are deeply committed to not going somewhere. And they're deeply committed to not going somewhere more than they're committed to going somewhere. This is a clever counterfeit. Just because you're, not, you're deeply committed to not doing something doesn't mean you will avoid uh, committing your own set of mistakes. I've seen this thought process in my own family and in the mindset of uh, many other couples throughout the years. Um, people that, that think or reason, and I probably was one of those at one time, uh, my life was impacted in a negative way by how my parents raised me, and I will not allow these set of things to exist in my family. And so the mindset is at the core a reaction rather than a plan to go somewhere, to accomplish something. It's the old sports adage of uh, playing a game not to lose rather than playing to win. It's funny, you will not find sports coaches, successful sports coaches that last in, a, in any sports industry that are thinking, I'm going to play the game. I'm going to teach my team not to lose. No, they teach to win. Successful coaches put together a game plan that's based on the things that if we learn to do them well, we greatly increase our chance of victory. So here's a practical example of, that some of you might identify with. <coughs> Picture a home where every time dad gets frustrated or under any kind of uh, personal pressure, um, he yells. As a child growing up in that home, uh, there's a basic hatred of yelling that begins to be fostered. And unfortunately, even some of that hatred is uh, pointed towards dad because of his inability to communicate in a proper fashion. Uh, the child moves out, um, starts their own family, and says to themselves, I'm going to raise my children in a home where there is no yelling. Is this an end? Is rearing children that won't yell and scream um, at their own children an end? Or is it a means to an end? There's a reason people don't yell and scream at each other in a healthy relationship. Train to the reason, not the action. Train to the reason not the action. If you teach a child to love others, to love and honor the person they marry, to treat people with respect, uh, there's little need or desire to yell or scream as a form of communication. If you just teach a child not to scream, they won't necessarily grow up and treat people with respect and love. Train to the reason, not to the means or the action. Okay, back to the plan, beginning with the end in mind. If a, if a young parent, uh, as a young parent, you, you can see in your mind's eye the person you want to have standing in front of you as an adult. If you can close your eyes briefly and and speed up time 10, 20 years into the future, and you can envision this young adult standing before you, then you can turn around and kind of uh, reverse engineer, if you will, uh, in your mind's eye, uh, what 
kind of principles? What kind of um, character this person will need to become that? Um, what inherent principles your child will need to possess? I'm going to read again one other section out of this book. It's in a section entitled, All Things Are Created Twice. It says, begin with the end in mind is based on the principle that all things are created twice. There's a mental or first creation and a physical or second creation to all things. Take the construction of a home, for example. You create it in every detail before you ever hammer the first nail into place. You try to get a very clear sense of what kind of house you want. If you want a family-centered home, you plan to put a family room where it would be a natural gathering place. You plan sliding doors and a patio for children to play outside. You work with ideas. You work with your mind until you get a clear image of what you want to build. Then you re reduce it to a blueprint and develop construction plans. All of this is done before the earth is touched. If not, then in the second creation, the physical creation, you will have to make expensive changes that may double the cost of your home. The carpenter's rule is measure twice, cut once. You have to make sure that the blueprint, the first creation, is really what you want, that you've thought everything through, that you put it, uh, that you put it into bricks and mortar, each day you go to the construction shed and pull out the blueprint to get marching orders for the day. You begin with the end in mind. The same is true with parenting. If you want to raise responsible, self-disciplined children, you have to keep that end clearly in mind as you interact with your children on a daily basis. You can't behave toward them in ways that undermine their self-discipline, or self-esteem. Now, when we're talking about child-rearing, we could go through these trait by trait. Um, there are many traits a, a planning parent wants to make sure that their child ends up with. Um, if I turned you loose for a 10-minute uh, breakout session, you'd come back with a page full of these traits written down. For the sake of time, let's just grab one and examine it. Let's take the subject of respect, for example. If the spirit of the principle of beginning with the end in mind is in play, then we say to ourselves, when my son or daughter reaches adulthood, I want them to have the trait of respectfulness. I want them to have the inherent ability to treat others with respect. So what are the steps to get there? Uh, there would be a ton of do's and don'ts, uh, a ton of situational scenarios um, that inevitably come up in our life and in the child's life. And uh, we could talk about do's and don'ts until sunset and beyond. But what are the guiding principles behind the actions that will follow or foster respect. Respect begets respect. If you want to have respect, you have to give respect. If you want respect for a lifetime, you have to give respect for a lifetime. This applies to all relationships, not just parenting. There's an example that I read once. John D. Rockefeller Jr. was a, was a billionaire. Um, in the course of his day, he commanded the fortunes of a family that, that owned and operated a huge amount of business. We recognize his last name, no doubt. Um, and, it, and what he did on a daily basis affected uh, thousands, if not millions, of lives. His son, John D. Rockefeller III, 
was 14 years old when his father wrote a memorandum between Papa and John regarding an allowance. There were 14 components addressed in this memo. Now, we won't go through them all, but here's a billionaire speaking to a 14-year-old boy, and yet listen to the language um, of how he talked to his son. The 14th component was written as such. The allowance above set forth in the agreement under which it shall be arrived at shall continue in force until changed by mutual consent. It's interesting. To respect, to get respect, you have to give respect. To establish a life of respect, you must model it and hold yourself to it, no matter the station or authority. Personal example, uh, when I was 17, I, I had a, a friend who was in the church, uh, but had moved out of town. Uh, he was in a very rough uh, family situation. Uh, I knew my parents didn't, didn't like me hanging around him because they told me on a number of occasions to pick a better friend. Um, they didn't uh, force me to do that, but they often told me it would be better if I found better friends uh, to hang around. Um, and this, this friend had moved uh, quite a distance away and uh, we had kept in contact a little bit. It wasn't like the cell phone age back then. And so long distance phone calls cost mom and dad something. So you often wrote letters or whatever. Uh, one Friday, this friend called me and was tearfully desperate to uh, leave his painful home life at the time and escape a potentially life altering scenario that he found himself in in high school, the local high school. He, he frankly needed an immediate intervention. He asked me if I would pick him up at the bus station in Portland, if he could get the money to buy a bus ticket. And he was going to do that that day, and it was Friday. And I just said, yes. My dad and mom had no idea what I had promised. Um, in fact, when I asked to borrow the car on Friday evening, they didn't think twice about it. Um, but when I came home with my friend and his suitcase, the gig was up. Not a word was said. Uh, mom got a sleeping bag. Uh, dad retired to his den, I assume for prayer. <laughs> Um, and only silence through the weekend until Sunday morning. And Dad woke us up and said, after breakfast, we're going to talk. So Dad pressed hard in conversation at breakfast uh, to understand why this had happened. He, he was investigating. And when he seemed satisfied with the information that he was told, Dad made a statement that I will never forget. He said, looking my friend straight in the eye, he said, you're still here because I trust my son. And I went, whoa. Then he continued to lay down some ground rules. <laughs> and uh, my friend continued to live with us for about six months under these ground rules. Later, my dad uh, made another deposit in my overdrawn account, if you will. Uh, he asked me why I had not come to him earlier and involved him from the beginning. And I said, I knew there was a chance you would say no, and I just couldn't have that happen. And uh, looking back, this 
uh, you know, as a, as a father of four kids, having gone through some situations that are at least similar, I know that that had to smart a bit for a father. But then dad said something that I'll never forget. Sorry, I'm emotional when I remember this. He said, I respect you for that, even if I don't agree with you. Interesting response. If you want to have respect, you have to give it. You have to give it. If you want respect for a lifetime, you have to give respect for a lifetime. It has to be who you are. For young parents, when a child grows up in a home where respect flows both directions between mom and dad, and they see respect flowing in the home freely and from the home toward others, the end result is the child not only understands respect when they see it, but they have learned to model it because they witness it at work and they have both reaped the benefits of it and witnessed others reaping the benefits of that respect. The society I grew up in has uh, changed a bit over the years. I don't know, has it, has it changed for you? Um, when my uh, dad was a young boy, uh, if he got in trouble at school, what would happen? You would get in trouble when you got home, right? And uh, I remember my dad and mom both sharing stories of if you got smacked by somebody else and you got whipped when you got home too, right? Things have changed a bit in the world. Uh, today's culture, if a child gets into trouble at school, the, uh, the parent or the parent seeks a pound of flesh from the teacher or the administration, right? Um, now, I'm not advocating blind adherence to wrong motivations. But where's respect gone in the culture of today? As a society, we demand it, and you hear it, turn on the news, all these groups demand respect, but they're not giving it. They're not giving it. We've shifted from a parental standard of you will treat with respect those that are over you, or when you get home, you're in trouble. We've moved from that to if you get in trouble with them, I'll go and share a piece of my mind with them. There's no personal accountability for respect that exists much anymore in this society. As a society, we're not ending up with children or adults that understand respect. There are some scriptures that are, are pretty blunt and to the point in regard to the topic of respect. Jude 8 through 10 is uh, a bit more blunt than 2 Peter is, so we're going to turn to 2 Peter. Although 2 Peter 2, uh, Peter's uh, pretty straightforward as well about this, um, very, very much to the point. Um, we have to break into a very long account by Peter to capture something he says that addresses what, what, what we're talking about here. But in 2 Peter 2, in verse 10, it says, And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and, des and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas, now listen, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. You know what Peter offers up here is some insight into parenting and respect. Even if that wasn't Peter's primary focus here. 
He's addressing false prophets, uh, false teachers, but the principle remains the same. The angels have the good sense to know, to know who they serve, and in modern vernacular, they keep their mouth shut when it comes to the things that are the Lord's authority and not their own. They have and show respect for the plan of God and who God is. Peter says there are those that think they live of their own authority, presumptuous, self-willed, and speak evil of and toward others. And these people have an end, and it's not the end result any of us are looking for that he spells out there. <coughs> uh, some of us have witnessed this kind of disrespect, unfortunately, even in the church in some form or fashion through the years. It's a human condition, right? And hopefully it causes us to, to stop and think about how we are thinking and reacting in the midst of what Peter calls speaking evil, which means defaming, reviling, slandering, blaspheming, damaging a reputation. Peter compares people who would do this to brute peace, um, made to be caught and destroyed, pretty harsh language. And, the, and Peter's, Peter's using language that's, that's uh, a little more tame than Jude 8 through 10 uses. Where did the angels learn their respect? Their Lord is our Lord. And Christ, while he was on the earth, left an abundant legacy of modeling respect toward others. Where are our children learning respect? Are we respecting one another in the family of God? I think we strive to. I think our heart is right. And I think it's happening. The next generation in the church must have this inherent trait of respect toward God and toward others to receive the blessings God has in store for them. Respect is a powerful tool for our children to learn and for us to possess and to use for a lifetime. Proverbs 12, 24 says, the hand of the diligent will rule, but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. This principle rings true in parenting as much as it does in our own personal lives. If we are purposeful and disciplined about what we put into the job of parenting, but what we put into the job of being a brother and a sister in Christ in the family, about who we are and what we want each other to be. Then Proverbs 20, verse 7, will apply. The righteous lead blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. The enduring godly spiritual principles we choose to live by as parents and as people of God are a generational blessing from God. The Godhead began a long time ago with the end in mind. And everything that they've been doing together is to that end result. Make the deliberate choice in your life to begin each day with the end in mind, and you will not be disappointed with the results.